I might say this every year, but don't these years go quick? And it's just, I can't believe it since it's a year since we were in Rotherham for those that attend every year, and it's nice to see you all again. Um, I'm going to get my thing on. Um, first part of mine, this time we'll, we'll look at um, the annual review that's in the annual report. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a, a whiz through the stuff that um, is in the annual report, if you're bothered to, to look at it, um, and just to pick some things out that, that are in there. Um, starting with membership, the overall membership has increased, as it does every year, because we always get more pensioners and more deferred members, and we also get some extra active members as well. So it, it's always going to be an increase in number. Um, and this year, it, it's gone up to uh, 141,719. I was just thinking earlier, it's a good job that they don't all come, because <laughs> that catering would be in trouble, wouldn't it, if, if we did. Um, but um, a sizable number, and that's a sizable number that we're actually providing a service for. And when we're looking at pensions administration, that's, that's really what we're here for, to provide that service to to those members, and as we'll come on to the next slide, on to the employers as well. Um, the active membership has increased. We had a bit of a dip when um, the, the um, reductions in, in, in staff at the, particularly the district councils, took over from um, the fact that new members were joining, and we had a couple of years where we were having reductions in those. But it started to revert a little bit. It's not gone up very much, but over the last couple of years, as you can see from the graphs, that we've, we've started to increase a little bit in, in that area. And then overall, the new pensioners and deferred members. And so you can see that the deferred members and the pensioners are going up in percentage terms faster than the active members. So it will not be long in a few years' time when these graphs were, will show that the, the pensioners and the deferred members will actually be more than the active members in the fund. But those are numbers, but for me, they are people, they are scheme members, and it's the people that we're providing the service to. I mentioned employers. We can see that that graph is slowly growing off the top of the, the chart, and uh, the number of employers, I think, looking at it at the moment, slowing down a little, but oh, you can see over the last few years, it, it's just been rising, and uh, I know I've explained this before to you, but um, it doesn't increase the numbers of members because the members are typically transferring from one employer to the new employer, particularly in the education sector, coming from the local council to their own academy status. What it does for us in pensions administration means we've got a whole set of new employers uh, with employer responsibilities that we've got to get them to, to get on board with and, and to carry out the functions of an employer. While at, they're at the council, they obviously have been there a long time and the council knows what it's doing. When it becomes for the school to do it on itself, then at that point we've got to make sure that they get the information to be able to administer their, empl their employees' benefits correctly. So that, that's the challenge for us. And as you can see there, at, at the year end we had 320. Currently with 335 with another 33 in the pipeline. And that's why I know it's slowing down because if, if we look back at last year, we had something like 60 odd employers in the pipeline waiting to, to be admitted into the scheme and, and that number is, is the lowest it's been for a while. But 417 in total, um, the ones that are in addition to the 335 are ones that have members but they've no active members actually paying in at the moment so they only have pensioner members and deferred members left uh, at the moment. Um, and as I mentioned, the academies, there's 181 of them. So that's 181 separate employers who are relatively new into the fund. Looking at performance, I'll come on to performance in a bit more detail in the second half of uh, my presentation. But um, we, we did in the year 58,953 cases, which is about typical. So that's about as many as, as we normally do in, in a normal year. Uh, however, performance was awful. Uh, awful for me to stand here. I'm usually a bit smug standing in front of 99.6 and 99.7% performance. And we dropped um, to 70.6% to uh, at the year end. And, and as you'll see in a little while, we've, we've been worse than that as well. 
And that's due to the, the new pensions administration system that uh, Councillor Ellis mentioned in, in her opening remarks. And I'll, I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail later. But um, not happy about it, but it, it will start to, uh, to improve. And hopefully I can give you a bit of reassurance uh, that things are starting to get a little bit better uh, as we go along. The, the number of complaints were up. Uh, we usually have probably four to eight in a year. The number of formal complaints increased during the year. And that was mainly, again, due to the, the performance. It was where we weren't able to, uh, to meet the customer's expectations as good as we normally would. Um, particularly because whatever we were paying to them would have been delayed because of the new system and so on. In fact, we did have quite a lot more complaints than formal complaints. Formal complaints that are complaints that are directed then um, escalated up to our complaints manager, Ian, uh, and he, he does a, a formal process of responding on behalf of the authority to that member um, and, and to, to provide any remedy that can be provided. Um, the informal ones are where our staff have to front them. Uh, and I have to say they've, they've done a sterling job through the year because they were in a position where they are really proud of the actual work that they do and the performance and the statistics that we always have come to you with in terms of the 99s and, the, and so on. Uh, and for them, it was a real um, kick in the teeth that they ended up through no fault of their own, not being able to meet those expectations. So they were at the sharp end, as it were. And the fact that um, many of the informal complaints didn't turn into formal complaints is as a result of them being able to talk to scheme members to explain the situation and to provide answers to them. They may not have always been able to put things right, but they, they did it in such a way that meant that they didn't actually come through to be formal complaints. So that, that was really good. Um, we've continued to survey members um, on a range of different things and surveys in the year shows that overall satisfaction is 98.6%, which is great. Um, had we carried on with the downward turn, then that might have changed over time, but at the moment that, that's um, as good as, well, it's not as good as it can possibly be, but it, it's, it's pretty good at 98.6%. Uh, we benchmark with other local authorities. Um, it, this is not what's in the annual report. I, I'd say this every year, but it, it's that what's in the annual report is the one from the previous year. This, what I'm showing you here, is as at 31st of March um, 15, um, but we only get the results around now. I, I've only got the results about um, a week or so ago, so it's obviously too late to put into the annual report. Um, disappointingly, um, the numbers of funds participating has dropped. Um, we are a regular participant and I've seen this number as high as 60. Um, and uh, I can't guess why people are not actually participating. It may be because they've got uh, backlogs of work and things that they don't want to share. But at, at the end of the day, um, the ones that have, uh, at least we can match against those. And they do um, include the big councils, the, the big other metropolitan funds, and people like us as well. So it's a useful comparison with uh, like-minded funds. Um, the cost per member is showing us £17.86, so that's effectively for each and every one of you in the year, we spend £17.86 on you to provide the service that we provide. So that's everything from um, dealing with new starters, joining the fund, right through to paying pensions to everybody and, and, and so on, and everything that we do in from a pensions admin perspective. And we've been consistently below average. Um, and that's, we want to be below average in that respect. Um, sometimes it's good to be above average, but in this case, it's good to be below average. Uh, and as we see there, it, we've been below average on 12 of, out of the 13 years of participation. So what that tells us is that um, we, we provide a, a good service for a below average cost. And, and that's, that's the, the way that you, you need to be looking at it. Um, just a few other things. The, the survey is quite big and, and there's, there's lots of things in there. So I've just picked out a few things to, uh, to show to you. But I mentioned our employers. Well, if you look at the average fund, they have only 223 to our 417. Uh, and then I like this as a, as a Yorkshireman. Uh, we like our cash. We like to take cash instead of pension. And so 94% uh, of our members say they 
give me as much cash as you like. I'll take a lower pension, but give me the tax-free cash. Uh, where uh, surprisingly, and it always surprises me this, that elsewhere uh, the average fund is about 60%. And if you think that's the average, then there's some that are actually lower than that, of course. So that's um, the benchmarking. But uh, as far as we're concerned, that's a, a good result for this year. Uh, the annual report contains some um, membership statistics. And I'll just throw a few things in here just to, to show you. They, I mean, it, it's, we do this year on year, and we put the statistics in the annual report every year. But given the nature of what they are, they don't change significantly. It's, we, um, there's a requirement um, within the scheme rules and the, um, uh, the way that you have to present your annual report to put fund statistics in, and so we do. But some of them would take years and years and years to change. But um, I've just picked a few highlights. You can see that we, um, in terms of the uh, female-male splitting scheme membership, uh, it, it's definitely uh, in for active members and, and deferred. It's, it's, a, it's a female type of workforce these days, particularly, as I say, on the actives for people who are still working. The pension split is still the same, but it does hark back from earlier times when it was more male-dominated in, in the earlier years. Um, and so that's why there's the difference there. Average pay, a meagre £20,000. Um, local authority pay is not, um, not as high as the other public sector uh, areas. Um, deferred pension always will be on the low side because deferred members are people who have left early. So they've not worked their full career. So their pensions, we, we've got some deferred pensions that are about 50 quid a year. And that people who have worked a few, a few months and then left. And at some point they'll either get that paid or they'll transfer it to a new scheme. Um, but, but essentially that's why that, that figure is much lower. The, the pensioning one is a bit more revealing because that is what people are receiving. So that's the, the fruits of their, their working life. Um, and again, not a huge sum as an average pension, 4,456 a year. Average ages, 45 for actives. Well, I'm well above that. So that's, um, deferred, 45, the same. Uh, and pensioners, 70. Now, if you're looking at your um, pack, you might see that the next slide says commercial break. I thought, since we're doing live and it's as if we're on TV, we might as well have a commercial break. So I'm going to take a bit of a rest and I'm going to let uh, my assistant uh, give you um, a bit of a demonstration of our new online system, which you may have seen the advert for out there, um, but um, is, is mentioned in the pack. And I'll hand you over now for the next six minutes my to overview. my assistant. Welcome to the My Pension Overview. My name is Penny and this short demonstration is intended to give you an overview of the online access to scheme member records which is due to be launched in the very near future. Enter the user credentials you created, then select next. Answer the security question with the answer you specified during registration. This will then take you to the logged in home page where you can change your password, and view your personal details. You can check and update your personal details. You are able to submit a change of address. Submit a change of contact details such as contact number and email address. Inform us of a change in marital status. Submit a secure query. On the personal details screen, you are able to choose an account to view. 
This will then take you to details about the account. View your pension history details. We have also created a new area, My Documents, to hold future correspondence, such as your benefit statements. We plan to add more correspondence to this area, over time. Within My Options, you can submit a death grant nomination. Enter the nominee details in these following easy steps. Select back to return to the personal details screen. If you have another pension with us, you can select it from here. This will then take you to details of that pension account. For further information select from one of the following options. View your membership details. Correspondence relating to this account will appear within my documents. These documents remain secure for whenever you may need. This concludes our demonstration for members who hold either an active or deferred pension. I would now like to introduce the options a pensioner's account has available. After logging in, select the personal details. Here you have the same options available to you to amend your personal details. Select the account's details you wish to view. Further information related to this account is available here. Select to view your current bank account details. Your tax code details are also available. Within the My Documents area, you will find both your P60 and Payslip information. Selecting P60 will display the ones currently available. Selecting the year of Payslips will display a list of Payslips you can view. You can use this as a file store, and return when required. The payslip will display details of both payment and deductions if applicable. If you move banks, then the option to inform us of your new bank details is available. Thank you ever so much for your time. If you have any questions please ask Gary who will be pleased to help you. It's a bit of a work in progress that, but I'm thinking of letting her do it all next year. You remember this guy from last year? That was me. It's, don't, it's not me really, but that was how I felt last year when we did um, the perfect storm, in which we were already describing the fact that we'd got a new pensions administration system, but at the same time we'd got the actuarial valuation, um, and we'd also got the new pension scheme. So everything was coming together at that time, and that's just how I felt. Uh, well, it's kind of. 
followed on a little bit because once we got the new pensions administration in and running, it didn't do what we wanted it to do. Um, it, it basically, uh, we went live probably a year before we, we really ought to have gone live with no option. The uh, previous supplier wanted us off their system by the end of December last year. So we had to go live with an IT project that wasn't ready to do. Um, and of course, uh, we had the job to do and carry on, and, and to carry on and, and do what we, we needed to do. Um, so that resulted in what I'm calling a horrible year. The Queen called it that in, I think, in 1992. Um, and, and it resulted at its peak that we had a backlog of casework of 13,000 cases. Now, in pensions administration, we've, we've probably 35, 36 staff doing pensions administration. Um, so for that many cases against that few staff, that was an awful lot of work to be done. Um, to counteract that, we've, we've been working overtime during the year. Um, a hardy bunch that have done it Basically, since mid-January up till now, um, that, that is probably will end uh, around Christmas time, um, hopefully with our um, backlog gone, and that's what we're, we're aiming for, and that's, that's where we are and we're working towards at the moment. And as you can see there, in October 15, the, um, the backlog is down to 4,500 cases, and some of those are actually normal running cases because, of course, work is coming in all the time. So it's not a case of just getting down to zero. And if, if at any given time, at any point, if you'd have looked, said to me, how much work you've got, we'd have always had a few thousand cases that we're actually working on, because that's his work. It, it, it keeps going as we go along. Um, but as you can see, performance um, during the period from October 14, uh, when, when we started to go live with, with the new system, um, right through to uh, the end of August 15 uh, was a terrible 56.17%. Um, and um, that, that's probably been the low ebb uh, and we've, we've come through and started to come through that. If you look at what I'm showing you there for September, uh, we completed 7,500 cases in the month uh, and we increased the performance to 627 uh, I've just run some stats this morning based upon October, up from the 1st to, to, to yesterday, um, and the performance was 86%. So I'm really pleased about that because that shows that we are starting to actually do more work that is, is current and therefore meeting the targets that we've set um, than backlog work, which is still being worked on and will still drag the figures down for, for a while. But, um, but we're starting to revert. So that, that's the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I hope if any of you have experienced any uh, poor performance um, from us during the year that you've called us and we've not met the, the usual expectations, I apologise for that. Um, but it, it has been a, a trial. Uh, we're still pushing very hard the software supplier uh, to meet our demands on various issues. The online stuff that you've just seen has been an absolute nightmare to get um, there. And in fact, online has not been available since April 14. Um, and just to get what you saw on screen there working has been an absolute trial. But we are getting there now. And, and hopefully that is going to be released within the next couple of uh, weeks. Bad news for pensioners and deferred members. I usually put this towards the end of the presentation, but I didn't want to leave on a bad note. Um, but and don't blame me. I'm, I don't. I don't do the infl inflation figures. But unfortunately, we were in negative inflation in September, and, and for the increase that we pay in April, that we normally pay in April, um, we use the September figures. That's the way it works, and that's what we always do. Uh, and the figure for September was minus 0.1%. Uh, now, we don't take money off pensioners and deferred members, um, and so therefore that means that the increase, if you can call it that, is zero, meaning that there will be no increase in 2015, 2016. Ah, just noticed something wrong on my side in 2016. 
Um, not so for active members because the LGPS 2014 is now known as a care scheme and what that ha means is that your pension is earned in the year and it's revalued and it's revalued by the inflation factor and if the inflation factor is minus the government can choose to reduce pensions in the active member accounts. So if you're building up a pension like I am um, then there's a possibility that my pension might go down by 0.1% the bit that relates to uh, post-14 benefits. But it's a government decision to do that. It's not automatic, and we don't know whether that's going to happen or not yet, or whether that revaluation will just be zero. So we'll, we'll wait and see on that. Current issues. Um, for those last year, do you remember Aldi car park with all the supercars from people cashing out their pensions and taking cash? Um, well, that hasn't really taken off, uh, not in the fund. Um, we've, we've had a few inquiries, we, particularly companies who have grasped by phoning people up, cold calling members and trying to say, well, I'll get you a pension for you and that kind of stuff. So we get inquiries of that nature. Um, but I don't think we've actually paid one over yet. Um, in terms of that, people have gone and got the advice and everybody has to have advice before they can get the cash. Um, and so far, it seems that the advice is winning out, that leave it where it is, mate. Um, and, and basically, um, people aren't doing it. It may well grow, um, but at this moment in time, I was kind of a bit worried about it last year, but it hasn't really taken off just yet. End of contracting out um, is something that is going to cause us a, a significant amount of work. Um, contracting out is, is the government scheme that started in 1978 um, and as local government pension scheme members you didn't participate in it, you were contracted out. Um, and what that means is that a figure is built up by the government that we've got to pay a minimum pension for. If we don't pay that amount, we've got to pay that minimum pension. Because contracted out ends on the, 30, on the 5th of April 16, um, the government wants us to match the figures that we have with the figures that they have and make sure that they're the same. And they're doing this for every single pension scheme in the country. Uh, and it is a significant piece of work because invariably the records aren't the same and then there's got to be some action to, to determine what to do, who is right, and how that will affect the pensions going forward. Pensions taxation is uh, something that uh, is becoming more of an, of an effect for us. We have to provide information for individuals uh, who may be caught by the lowering of the pension taxation limits. So people now who uh, are earning bigger and bigger pensions will start to hit these lower limits and then they will have to pr either pay extra pension, uh, sorry, extra taxation or take a reduction in their pension uh, to avoid it. So um, it, it's more work that we've got to do. And in terms of public sector exit pay cap, this is where the government now are, are saying that if you get a payout, if you made redundant, for example, from a local authority, and your payout is in excess of £95,000, the excess over and above that can be abated, and that can be taken from any redundancy payment or your pension lump sum or even your pension. Um, now, £95,000, you might think, oh, well, they're being paid quite a lot if they're getting £95,000, but in the local government pension scheme, they, they actually include the redundancy payment but the cost of letting you retire early, not the amount of money you're receiving. If you retire early, there's a cost to the pension fund for retiring early, because your normal retirement age might be, say, age 65, and if you went at 55, you're retiring 10 years earlier than you otherwise would have been expected to do so. So there's a cost there, which we then charge the employer. And that's, that's all what we always have done, and the employer meets that cost, and that's all part of the deal that the employer works out for letting somebody go early retirement under those terms. But where that cost is, that will add to the £95,000. So the member's not receiving it, but they may take a reduction as a result. We've 
had a, another so-called consultation on that where there wasn't an awful lot uh, notice taken to what um, people responded to. Um, so now we await the detail of how that's all going to work. Right, so here's my quiz. Who wants to answer these? Or shall I answer them? Okay. Um, in terms of... Uh, we've, we, we asked four members to pre-submit questions, so rather than having you speak and to, to, to ask them here, I thought we'd, we'd put them down, the, the ones that I can answer anyway, um, and just respond. So if this is your question, I'm responding, but I'm responding generally anyway, just so that everybody else knows. So we had a question that said, what benefit do I get for being in the scheme for over 40 years? And I think this was driving at the fact that um, there was a misunderstanding that um, after 40 years, benefits would, uh, would stop accruing and that you didn't get anything for being in the scheme beyond that period of time. That's not the case. That used to be the case. Um, when I started that um, you could only get 40 years in and if you got 40 years in by age 58, once you got to 60, you lost two years of your benefits that you'd paid in for. That's not the case anymore uh, and you can carry on accruing benefits as long as you can and as long as you don't get hit by these tax rules, then, then you're okay. So um, no worries is basically the answer to that. Um, future of pensions for women, a, a lady asked, said she, and I don't think this is just local government pension scheme related, this is just about worrying about her children who, who were daughters uh, in the workplace and about pensions for women. And I think the answer here is, is just generally, I think, men and women, they, there is plenty of scope for people to pay pensions these days. You don't have to be in a... Um, an employment with a pension scheme, you can make your own arrangements and all employers anyway have to what's known as auto enrol their members. It's not as good a pension scheme as ours but it's a pension scheme um, and, and, and therefore there is much more availability. Um, again particularly for women I, I suppose because in, again when I started it was very much um, male orientated and it, and it, and it has changed o over the years. I think the trick is, is, is if you're talking about your kids, is getting them to do something, getting them to pay, because my daughter's 23, and I can't, this is my job, pensions, and I can't get her to pay into a pension. I can't get her to take her money and save it um, as a pension, because I know the logic of that, because the earlier you start, the better pension you will get at the end of the day, uh, but I can't get her to do it. Um, she wants to spend the money on cars and holidays and everything else, but... You know, so getting them to do it. I can't remember who I was speaking to, but um, somebody told me that they had already started a pension for one of their kids who was age 13. So as a parent, they were setting them off on the road. And, and you can do it. You, you can put money aside for pensions, even at that age, and, and, and do it. So the answer to that question is really, is, is, it's out there to get people motivated to do it. Somebody asked um, how many employees over, earn over £100,000. From the question, I wasn't sure whether that was for the Pensions Authority or for the Fund in general, so I'll answer both. For the Pensions Authority, it's none. Um, although, if we do a pay rise, I'll have one. Um, um, and, but for the Fund, um, it's, it, there's, well, the last time we checked, and because of the... the issue with our system. We're not as fully up to date, but there were 32 people and over £100,000. That's in the whole of the pension fund out of the 50,000 or so members that we've actually got. Um, a widower wanting to know what happens to uh, his pension when he dies. Um, depends on when you're retired. Um, in terms of um, if, you're, if you're a receipt of a pension in your own right and still a widower, uh, then uh, if you're retired and you're within 10 years, then there's a 10-year guarantee, which is, will be payable to your nominee or to your estate if you haven't got a nominee. Outside of that 10 years, if you've been retired more than 10 years, then unfortunately it just dies with you. Um, someone asked about moving abroad in outside the EU about state benefits, not, not the local government pension scheme benefits. Our pension's paid anywhere, um, anyway. Um, but in terms of the state benefits, 
the benefits that are actually paid, um, state benefits, whatever country you go in, but if you're outside the EU, there's only a certain number of countries you can be in where you will still get the increases each year if you were going to get one. Um, and I have a list, so if that person is in the audience and wants the list, I've got a list of the countries you can go to um, where you will still get the increase, and whether that influences where you go, I don't know. But if you're already planned to go and you're not on the list, then you'll just get your state pension, but you'll get no increases for, for it. Last, last lot. Uh, pensions secure? Yes, they are. Um, basically, we can't run away with the money. Um, and in terms of um, the way in which the local government pension scheme works as a statutory scheme, um, then effectively benefits for as long as you can think of. You can um, obviously something that you can, can't think of that could happen that could change this, but as much as you can think of uh, are definitely secure. Um, and even if everybody's active members all stop paying in today, as John says, there's £5.8 billion pound in and that will keep everybody going for quite a while to come. But clearly everybody's not going to stop paying in because it's still going on uh, as, um, as far as we can see. Uh, can widows' pensions be converted into a cash lump sum? The answer to that is yes, there are uh, limits. So if you're on a quite large widow's pension, you wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but at the moment, we're not. Uh, this is a, a, um, a benefit that is a discretion on behalf of the fund. And at the moment, we're not actually offering that discretion. However, sometime next year, um, we will be doing a full um, troll of everybody who could actually convert to a lump sum. That's not just widows, that are widowers, that's people pensions in their own right. Again, provided they meet the criteria for allowing them to do it. And we will be writing to them with, a, with a, um, an offer, if you like, to say, this is available, would you like to take it? But not at the moment because of the other issues that we've got to deal with. How does LGPS 2014 affect existing pensioners? Again, depends on when you're retired, because if you're retired before uh, 31st, uh, 1st of April 14, then it doesn't affect you at all, because you're in the old scheme, nothing transferred, so you're under the old scheme, so whatever rules applied at that time apply to you, and that's the pain that we have to deal with, because we always have to manage the other schemes going forward. Um, and if you retired after April 14, then you're in the new scheme and you'll get new scheme benefits. Uh, can a list of members be kept, uh, kept of members who own computers? This is in recognition that um, over time, the computerization of things will, will be taking over. Um, and, and, and certainly we need to keep an eye on um, who, who we can respond to electronically and so on. So uh, I think the, the trick here is, is if, uh, and you can do this through our website, if you've got a computer, then you can just register on there. You can get electronic communications if you wish, or you at least just register your email address, and then you can uh, either contact us that way or, or otherwise. But then we'll know eventually all the people are who haven't got computers, and we, but we will not be switching off doing anything in paper and, and print. We'll be still doing that. We won't go down that route uh, for many years to come. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>